good out there live in the building we have none other than brandon novak how you doing brandon i'm good man i'm good just got off a flight from philadelphia uh in beautiful orange county how's how's the trip man it was good well it was now i completely lied there it was a delay and uh delays are, are rather boring in airports if you don't drink you know what i mean so it's yeah. like only so much food you can eat and and so much browsing in stores you can do yeah man they got the they got the starbucks there but that doesn't cut it usually no then it just gets me all hopped up and now it's like <laughs> i just sniffed a whole bunch of cocaine and i have nowhere to go or nothing to do so uh yeah it doesn't work <laughs> yeah man so you seem to be uh pretty busy nowadays yeah yeah busy is an understatement you know it's funny my life before was just nothing but time like right. i had all the time in the world to now like literally every moment is accounted for right and so you know um let's let's kind of start from the beginning uh when you first started um just getting some exposure you were doing some skating right yeah yeah so i started out as a, a skateboarder you started skateboarding and then uh -huh. and then um you know from skating you went to what is it uh, you, you hooked up with bam right yeah well you know bam and i were oh that's the emergency alert oh boy oh, something's happening amber alert action a amber alert action all right, we'll let that. That's perfect timing. <laughs> that, that, Fitting that, for this that, story. That, that's the story of my life right there. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll we'll let that go. Sure. But um, but yeah. So so you hooked up with the uh, Bam. Yeah. So I, you know, I was a, I was a skateboarder first and foremost. That's my love. It's that's my language of the heart. And uh, at a very young age, uh, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and and another professional skateboarder by the name of Bucky Lasik is also from Baltimore. Um, Bucky was already pro for Pal Peralta. He had got me sponsored by Pal. And we used to take these weekend road trips up to Westchester, Pennsylvania to skate this skate park called Cheap Skates. And we had seen this kid there that was my age, yeah. dressed alike, very similar in styles of skating and really doing unique tricks that were outside of the box thinking. And it was bam, lo and behold. And uh, he wasn't sponsored and he really wanted to get sponsored. So Bucky and I were trying to get him on Pal. But we would stay at his mom's house, Ape and Phil's house, every weekend, and they would make us, like, these Rice Krispie treats and all this food. And so we became really good friends. And then from that, he got sponsored, I was sponsored, and we were, we were arch enemies in contests. So every year there would be this big contest called the NSAs, the National Skateboarding Association Contest. And, and all year I'd practice and he'd practice, and either he would win or I'd win. And um, one year he had been practicing as always, and, and, and he's at the contest, and Bucky's there, and, and – Bam's like, where's Novak? And, and Bucky's like, I think he's on heroin. <laughs> and, and Bam's like, what's that? You know, he had no mm -hmm. idea. And uh, that continued to unfold. But what happened was my disease of addiction progressed. It continuously got worse. Um, Bam did better in the world of skateboarding and just life in general. And one time I went to this skate shop in Baltimore where I would go in and, and bum a couple bucks off them. I was homeless. I was a heroin addict. And they said, we're not going to give you any money, but Bam was here doing a demo yesterday and he left his phone number for you and said, if you ever want help to call him. So then uh, one day I used that number and he came and picked me up from Baltimore and let me live at his house. Oh, wow. He let me, uh, he really wanted to get me back clean. into, yeah, clean yeah. and skateboarding, the, the, the raw things in life that, that made me happy and us happy. And, uh, you know, he put me in his movies, the CKY movies. Yeah. He put me on his TV shows, Viva La Bam, and then that progressed into the movies. How old were you when you first started using? Um, I was about 16 years old. So I had young. used, I had yeah. drank and smoked some weed at like 12, but okay. it wasn't like a necessity at that point mm -hmm. then. Now, so you had, you had, I mean, there's a difference between drug abuse and drug addiction, right? Would you say that? Or, or would you say it's a, it's on the same level? It, it teeters on the same line. You know, it's really not a one size fits all. Okay, Cause, so because my, my I know people that can abuse it and then they put it down and go to work on Monday. Right, you like cl closet uh, addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, there's a lot of functioning addicts that are out there now, and um, one of the things that that kind of uh, drew me to you know asking you if you wanted to come on here was because. I had uh, been on the internet and I've seen some of your videos and I, I found them to be really intriguing and I, I felt the message was super important. But then I started looking at your story and I found that your addiction goes back to your early age. And, I, and, and, but you know, the one thing is, is did somebody, I mean, obviously you knew you were doing the drugs, but did somebody stop you? Like besides Bam, did any of your family members stop you and say, Hey, you know what? 
you either get clean or you're out. Well, the people that tried to stop me, I kind of shied away from because I didn't want them getting in between me and that bottle or bag. You right. know what I mean? So I completely exiled them from my life. Um, and the fact was, is I was a really successful individual at a young age. So people yeah. kind of, when I, when I was wrapped up in the disease of addiction, people were like, well, he was successful to this point. So maybe there's like a method to his madness, Yeah, you know, and, and they kind of believed that like I would come out of this thing. Did you believe that though? I did. I did it, because m my successes prior to my addiction became like my biggest uh, roadblocks in addiction because I'm like, dude, if I can do all this stuff that people said I could never do. Yeah. Then you're capable of just moving forward. Exactly. Like I'm capable of anything. I'm capable of doing what 90% of the people don't do, you know? And the disease of addiction is so powerful yeah. that it, it's the only disease that tells me that I don't have a disease. Yeah. It's in, it's your mind, right? Yeah. I mean, if you check it out, you, you diagnose me with HIV, I'm rushing to the hospital to get medication. I don't want to die. You diagnose me with cancer, I'm rushing to the hospital to get chemo. I don't want to die. Diagnose me as an addict or an alcoholic, I need a glass of wine or a bag of heroin to figure out what the hell's wrong with you for diagnosing me with said disease. Um, one of the things I wanted to tell you was, um, you know, they say... I have some interesting like uh, drug abuse facts mm -hmm. and they said over $24 billion is spent on drugs annually and 10% of Americans are on drugs. Now in your circle of friends, um, being that you got on the, I want to say the right path, mm. are there still influences around you that kind of tempt you into going back well, that's the thing for me. I was like beaten so bad by the disease of addiction. I was demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol to where I was like beaten into a state of reasonableness. I had did it for 26 years to where like it is no longer appealing. Like wow. the, the, those smoking mirrors no longer exist. That that sleight of hand type action. I see it for what it is. And, and, and the appeal or the euphoria, if you will, has long worn off. Really? Okay. So you, you started to do, I mean, you were on. Um, you, you went from CKY, right? Yes. And then you went from that to Jackass, right? Yeah. And then from, well, from that to Viva La Bam. Oh, Viva La Bam. I'm sorry. Yeah. And so Viva La Bam was on and I know I read somewhere and, and I saw it in a couple of your videos that you were saying that some of the stuff that went on the show, Viva La Bam and Jackass, some like most of the time you guys were, you guys were on a good one when you were doing these tricks. Is that, is that, you know, you know, true. I, I can't speak for the other people, but for myself, absolutely. And do you think that like when you were um, high on whatever, do you think that helped you um, play your role, like do the tricks or? Absolutely. I, because my inhibitions were down, you know, and you have to take a look at the circumstances I was in at the time. You get this guy who was a homeless heroin addict on Baltimore city, literally doing whatever it took to get the next $10 for the next bag. Whether well, that entailed selling my body, sleeping in abandoned houses, robbing, stealing, you name it. I did it. Anything wow. shy of homicide. And that's only because the opportunity never presented itself, but that's how the disease of addiction works for a fellow such as myself. So you take that guy that's doing those, that that's living on that animalistic level, that yeah. abnormal becomes the normal. And all of a sudden put him in, in this, world of of money power property prestige and 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 stardom if you will and then provide a very good paycheck at the end like there's nothing i wouldn't do so most of the stunts where people were like i don't want any part i'm like sign me up like yeah. nothing's yeah. as bad as where i came from now i saw i'm a big howard stern fan yeah 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 so Howard's great so i saw mm -hmm. on the howard stern videos yeah that you and bam said that you'd walk into a bar and just like make out sometimes just for the kicks of it. Absolutely. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. That is funny, man. Absolutely, man. And good times, right? Yeah, it, it was great because we really were about just getting that shock value, right. you know, as our whole career kind of has been. Um, and, and just kind of living uh, against the norm, if you will. Right. And, and not to go outside the scope of your story, but I seen mm -hmm. Bam's on the right track too. He was getting back into skateboarding, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's actually out here with me. We're going to the trade show the next two days. And then from here we fly out to Colorado for the zoomies hundred K awards. Okay. And then come back and he's filming something with fear factor. Wow. With ludicrous. Oh, that is awesome. Um, Tell us about a little bit more about what you're doing in terms of uh, motivational speaking. Well, 
it's funny, you know, I, I always say I, I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual. And, and I always say that, thank God, God is God and I'm not God because I'd put this whole thing into a bag, a bottle, a needle. I'd mess it up surely. Right. Um, and I also say that, like, when I want to make my God laugh, I tell him how my day is going to go. I say all that to say if you if you recognize the, the synchronicity in life that events have led me to hear are, are really uh, – powerful you reached out to me about a week ago right and you said i'm in this uh radio show in orange county and i rarely come to orange county i've been here maybe three or four times i'm like that's really ironic because mm -hmm. i'm flying into orange county in three days you know i don't believe in the words luck or coincidence i believe everything is destiny and fate and it was pre-written or predestined whether it was yesterday last month or 100,000 years ago so um the, the i believe that a, a power greater than ourselves saw fit for our stars to align and our paths to cross for me to be here right now right because this was the last thing i was ever planning on doing or or wanting to do right and that's in sobriety in, in a whole you know what i mean i had no intentions of, of doing this well i just i just honestly felt I think uh, in my, there's a saying that I always go by, a, a purpose of life is a life of purpose. And I, I yeah. think that um, your message, um, and, and we were talking outside about how the laws of attraction, yeah. I, I think um, it's not so much, in like you mentioned, to try to force somebody to go to rehab or try to shove a message down their throat, but, but more or less share your story and others will be able to relate to that. And then, you know, if, if you could share through your experiences and, and people can relate to that, then maybe that will help them and in, in where their path is going. Absolutely, because people such as myself or, or, or other people that are struggling and, and can't see past that bag, the bottle, the pill, they don't see a way out. But then, you know, if, if I or other people in recovery or not in recovery can share, it's that language of the heart to make them feel like they're not alone because they're not. Like I, I always say, together we stand, divided I die. Right. You know, like yeah. I, I can't do this thing alone. I'm not powerful enough. But on the same, on the flip side of the coin, I'm, I wasn't powerful enough to to lift my obsession or rid my desire to want to drink or drug. For 24 years, all I thought about every day and night, day in, day out, was getting high, getting high, getting high, or not getting high, not getting high, not getting high. And now all of a sudden, I'm coming up on three years sober, and I have a lot of ways and means, and, and financially I'm pretty secure. And the furthest thing from my mind is leaving here and going to get a drink, a bag, a bottle, a pill, a needle. Right, I didn't do that. I, I'm not powerful enough to do that. And that takes, that, in, in my opinion, once you've crossed that bridge, to go back to the starting point would just kind of ruin everything that you built. But it's so easy for you to do that, being that you're financially stable. You could yeah. you could easily call a dealer up and be like, hey, Absolutely. get me a 20. Absolutely. But I, I always say that this thing that I have, this disease that I suffer from called alcoholism, it's called alcoholism, not alcoholism. And I can't stay sober on yesterday's sobriety. So I do a few simple things along the way each day to maintain my sobriety. But I'm a guy that I've seen me forget where I come from. And then I am destined to return. You know, so that's why I do the public speaking format. That's why I continuously, I have two phones, one work, one personal, and it rings nonstop for people that need help. And I was going to ask about that because you've been so deliberate about putting out your phone number. Yeah. How many people reach out to you? Oh, nonstop, nonstop, really? nonstop. Yeah, because yeah. your number is actually on uh, one of your YouTube videos. Yeah. And you know what I was going to tell you was, let me get your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. So... Drug abuse is drug abuse. Do you consider now that, you know, January 1st, uh, medical marijuana is now legal, mm -hmm. would you consider marijuana abuse on the same level as heroin abuse? I mean, yeah. Well, here's my deal with that whole conundrum, if you will. Yeah. I, I've debated for a lot of years. On the flip side of that, I've shot heroin for a lot of years. You know, so who am I to say what works best for them? If if, if you're on marijuana maintenance and, and you provided this life that, 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 essentially makes you happy or whole mm -hmm. have at it if you're on methadone suboxone subutex the implant and you're happy with that life have at it you know i don't care if 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 this microphone keeps you sober have at it whatever it takes who am i to say what is or is not the right way to go about it because this thing isn't a one size fits all if that were the case i would have got it at my first treatment center at the age of 17 i didn't get it to my 13th treatment center at the age of 35 you right know? so so people that are on heroin, they're using Suboxone and, and, and uh, what is it, methadone. Yeah. Um, sometimes those people will abuse those 
Um, Absolutely. But the one good thing with that, well, I mean, there can be a lot of good things. I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. But the one thing that I really believe in and agree upon is, is that if you're on Suboxone or you're on Subutex or Methadone, um, you know what that will do? That that will provide you the opportunity to stay alive a little bit longer. Right. So God willing, one day you say, I'm tired of doing this maintenance drug. Then you can switch over because with the heroin these days, it's cut with the fentanyl. It's cut with the car fentanyl. People are literally sniffing one line and dying. Wow. Like literally, literally. That's not. And like, is that just because it's cut different? Yeah, they, they have this new stuff called fentanyl and car fentanyl, and it is like major. It's it's people are dying off sniffing bags of heroin, and that was unheard of when I was out there. Have you heard of uh, kratom? Yes, I have. And what are your thoughts on kratom? Don't really know much about it. Never experienced it. It's it's a it's a plant. It's grown in Malaysia. It's it's the same plant um, as the cocoa leaf. Um, it's supposed to. It's it's an opioid antagonist. So it's supposed it's supposed to um, activate or or um, get a reaction off the same um, brain cells mm. that you know you would get the euphoria off of. And it's like a tea or something, right? Right. Now see that's. Once again, to each his own, but I'm that kind of alcoholic slash addict that I know my disease. And my disease doesn't recognize, hey, a cup of tea that they sell from the coffee shop as opposed to a line that I just sniff or shoot out of a bag that I bought on the corner from the neighborhood drug dealer. It doesn't recognize the difference. You know, if I go to, if I break my arm and I go to the pharmacy and they give me 60 Percocets and they say, uh, take as prescribed when needed. My disease says, as prescribed and when needed, all right now, and I need more. You know, it, it, my, my yeah. disease doesn't say, okay, well, this is okay because it came from Rite Aid and you're legitimately hurt. My disease doesn't care. At your worst, yeah. what, what were you doing at your worst? Uh, at, uh, I'm, I'll skip to the end of my story. At, at the age of 35, um, I found myself homeless on the streets of Baltimore City. In theory and on paper, I was a very successful individual, had did things in life that people equate to success or happiness and a lot of even dream of doing. Um, in reality, I was a 35-year-old man whose worldly possessions consisted of eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, one stick of deodorant that fit into a bag that doubled as a pillow, and four cigarette butts that I dug out of a receptacle roaming the streets of East Baltimore. Uh, my mother had exhausted all opportunities, options, and resources. She physically and financially paid for four different treatment centers for me to go to. She was broke. She depleted several savings accounts. So she simply went to God with one prayer, and, and she was she's very big in the church in Baltimore. She went over to the church. Father Mike said, "Miss Pat, how's Brandon?" My mother, Miss Pat, said, "And Father Mike, he's never been worse. I I, I can't do anything left." So I, I went to God with one prayer. Father Mike said, "What's that prayer?" She said, "Father Mike, it's simple. The prayer consists of God, please cure him, kill him, or kill me because I can't take it anymore." Wow! And Father Mike screamed at my mother. He said, "How dare you go to that man with something like that? Little do you know, God has a plan for him." You don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. And Brandon damn sure doesn't know what it is. And that's why I say thank God I didn't know what it was because I would have gotten in the way of it and messed it up for yeah, sure. Yeah, you're a walking miracle, you can say. Yeah. You know, I had been in, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've overdosed. I, I've, uh, I've 13 inpatient treatment centers. I've been medevac to four different hospitals in four different states from four different overdoses. My mother had bought me a plot. People had taken life insurance policies out on me, and I was on life support at the end of my run during that. 35-year-old, eight scarves, two jackets deal. Uh, I was on life support for seven days. No one was betting on me to get sober, let alone stay sober, including myself. But I was like the alcoholic that wanted to kill myself on a daily basis, but the hit was I didn't want to hurt myself in the process. Mm -hmm. So I'd stay in this weird purgatory state where if you strap me up to a polygraph, I would pass with flying colors. Tomorrow was going to be different. I'd bet my mother on it. I'd love her more than anything. Only to wake up tomorrow to repeat yesterday's actions and be stuck in Groundhog's Day for the better part of 21 years. N now... Um, I had read that you got locked up at some point in time, right? Yeah, there's a lot of points in time did, of that. Did, did, <laughs> but you did a long stretch, right? Yeah, I did a year. Oh, you did? A, okay, yeah. that's uh, – that's. Yeah. I don't want to say it's, it's not it, – It depends upon one's perception. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and was that – I mean, outside the scope of, you know, reaching the point where you were almost overdosing and you almost, you know, died and um, was getting locked up going through those withdrawals inside was that kind of a moment of clarity too like you you or or is the drugs inside available just like you know street well they were available inside but i knew better to 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 catch a debt inside 
because you can't escape those people. You right. know, I'll rip you off outside on the streets, but like if I'm in a self-induced prison, literally with you and I owe you money, I'm not a fighter. I don't like confrontation. That's a yeah. lot. So it's just like quitting cigarettes when you're in prison. It's rather easy because it's just like mind over matter. So and, like, were, and were people recognizing you in there? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I <laughs> You were talking earlier about me, when me and Ben were on the Howard Stern show and, and we would go to a bar and they'd be like, oh, you homos. And we would kiss. right? Yeah. And then we would push each other away and then grab our girlfriends and kiss them for shock value. So I go in there and I have this tattoo on my arm. Uh, I, I have no problem with gays. I, I love them to death, but I find gay humor to be hilarious. Humor. Right. So. In the skateboarding world, rollerbladers are considered like gay or homos, made fun of them. So on my arm, I have this tattoo uh, of two dudes uh, banging. But two dudes banging doggy style is like gay, right? right. But two dudes banging missionary style it's while not. making eye contact is like a whole other level of gay. <laughs> But they're fully padded with rollerblades on. Wow. That is hilarious. So I have that on this arm. I have another uh, random, like, I don't know if I can cuss, but like a penis thing on this arm. And then on my butt cheek, I have these hearts on it. So I would, like, get a shower, and I'd get, like, a crystal meth shower. I'd be in and out in, like, a second. And then they saw them, and they're like, yeah, but Novak, we'd expect nothing less from you. And if it was someone else, they'd be, like, a prime candidate for uh, looking for a boyfriend. Yeah, that that is hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always I always chuckle when I when I uh, watch the videos. But um, what do you think? Um, where, where, what now? Where do you go from here? I mean, are you doing? Are you going to be doing motivational speaking at different seminars? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's funny. When I first got sober, I, I went into my therapist office. And she said, Novak, I want you to make a list of where you want to be within a year. And I respect this woman. I said, No, I'm not going to do that. And she looked at me sideways and she said, What do you mean? And I said. Because if I would have made a list of where I wanted to be within my first year of sobriety, I would have undersold myself dramatically. I would have put a cap on my happiness or the potential that I could reach. Because I walked in here, like I told you, eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, one stick of deodorant, four cigarette butts in my pocket. I was so low, the curb like a skyscraper. I was horrible at suicide because I kept waking up. And I just said, you know what? Everything that I thought I knew has gotten me here. So like the only thing blocking me from getting better was me. So I'm going to get out of my own way and follow some people's suggestions. And like, if I, I could sit here and go for hours of what I obtained, but now I, I, one of the many things that I do is I work in the drug and treatment industry field. And I work for a facility called Banyan Treatment Center. And we're in Chicago, uh, Florida, Boston, and, and come February in Pennsylvania, in my home state. So I just like being on the front lines of, of people that need help. Now, you could easily go out and get, you know, go back into the entertainment industry, but you've chose to devote part of your life into helping people out, which I, you know, commend you for. And, and I think that takes a lot for somebody to give a part of themselves and not go the other route because you could easily go get some gigs and go back to, yeah. you know, doing the same things you were before. Well, because what my deal, my story is tangible. There's right. substance yeah. there. You can see it in the movies. You can see it in the tabloids, on the internet, in my books. You you know it's the real deal. I was the junkie that was not supposed to get clean and, and actually die with a needle in his arm. And, and and that's a little bit diff. But then you also witness this rebirth of mine in movies, in tabloids, on the internet. So, so – it's a little different than a 50 year old professor reading out a textbook giving a bunch of theories or hypotheses no, of what may real. or may Your not story happen. Is real. Exactly. So when my phone rings, 99% of the people that call me, they say, Novak, if you can get clean, there's no reason why I can't. Can you help me? Wow. And uh, that's the language of the heart. I believe I truly went through what I went through to do what I'm doing now. They say if you love what you do, you never work yeah. a day in your life. Right. I've scored that a billion times over. When and did you realize that you had this purpose, that you had this story to share? I, I didn't. There wasn't a time or place where I'm like, that's it. I was living in a recovery house. My get well job was I was washing dishes for $6 an hour at 35 years old, a really accomplished guy washing dishes for $6 an hour, living in a recovery house with two other roommates in this room. And then I was waiting tables. And then this treatment center, Banyan, called me and said, hey, would you like to come speak to our client clients as a surprise? And I went down and the first day they toured me the whole facility, the detoxes, the housing, the residential, the PHP. And in my mind, I'm like, this is rather extreme. Are they going to ask me for a donation or something? I'm just here to share. Yeah. Next day, I'm in the in the in the in the room, and it was a surprise. The clients didn't know I was coming, and I go in there and I share. And this kid in the back, after I'm done, he puts his hand up. He said, "Novak, I hope you don't take offense to this, 
But literally three days before I came in here, me and my three other buddies were sitting around getting high, talking about you saying you were nothing but a junk box and you'll never be anything but a junk box. And that right wow. there made it all worthwhile to me because people such as him and myself were prone to act off impulse. We right. want to get high, we get high. We yeah. want to leave treatment, we leave treatment. And 99.9% of the time, we regret the decision we had made off impulse. So God willing, there come, God forbid one day there comes a time where he's just overwhelmed with anxiety and wants to leave. He can think back on this guy who was supposed to die with a needle in his arm, who he was talking about, and he didn't know it was coming. Yeah. So then the next day, I'm um, good friends with Chris Herring. Chris Herring kind of does the same thing that I do now, the basketball player. And uh, I, I, I said, look, what I want to do is for Jackass, I'm the talent. They fly me in. I film my scene. I leave. But it takes a whole team of people to make that happen. You have to get permits. You have to get locations, flights, hotels, camera crews. And I want to do that same thing in this treatment world. Uh, I want to fly in. I want to share my story. But I don't know how to work for a non-for-profit or find a non-for-profit. I don't know how to get locations. I don't know how to have a treatment center back me. This is what I want to do. And they said, well, we didn't fly you here for no reason. They had already had this plan set up. Wow. And little did I know. And I'm like, this is the deal. I tripped and fell into this world. I had no yeah. idea that this existed. Interesting. You have a very interesting story. Um, so... You know, now, are, are you planning on doing anything with the BAM and in, in anybody in the future? Yeah, I mean, we all have so many things going on. Uh, like, for me right now, I have uh, my second book just came out two months ago. Uh, we just finished my third one. That'll come out within a year. Uh, I have... You want to give the titles out? so, that, so I the, can't do that yet. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. um, but then, and then I have two more books to follow after that. I have the first ever addiction graphic novel coming out. I have a documentary... Uh, titled Where's My Needle, going to the Sundance and the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, wow. The graphic novel is called The the Chronicles of Brandon Novak. Yeah, I, I um, actually, I think I've seen a, a brief uh, article on that. So you got a, you got two books out. Yeah, and, uh, and I have three more to follow. Wow. I have the graphic novel coming out in a month, the, the documentary coming out, and then I, we're opening the treatment center. You know, and uh, and then I have my foot in this stuff. I'm going out to the Zoomies Awards in, in Colorado in two days for the Easy man and, and the trade shows here. And you know, and then I travel all around speaking, man. And, yeah. I, and then on top of that, my phone rings nonstop of people that need help. Do you have a website where people can see, or do they? Do most people hit you up on social media? Yeah, it, it, it all varies. You can find me on Brandon Double Underscore Novak for Instagram, and that's kind of what I run. And and people have the and but if, really, if you want to reach out to me and you want help or you you want me to speak or whatever the case may be, you can personally reach me at six one zero six three five nine zero nine two. I'm as transparent as as this phone that I'm holding in my hand. You right. know, like I, there's there's no walls in between me and people. And to all the listeners, we plan on uh, rebroadcasting this, and you can find this on the YouTube channel, Sancho Local Show. And, um, you know, um, one of the other things I want to mention is how do you filter some of these calls that come? Because I know there's people out there that aren't, you know, don't have addiction, and they're yeah. just pranking I, you and I, stuff. I, I get it, though. You know, 80% of the calls are people to see if it's really me. Right. Um, then there's the 5% that hang up, and then there's another 15 or 20 that actually need help. And at the end of the day, there's probably 10% that I can actually help. Right. But the phone rings nonstop, and if I don't answer, it's forwarded directly to the treatment center. Okay, is there, is there anything else uh, you want to let the listeners know? I just want to let people know, man, that addiction is not a death sentence, man. Your history does not have to dictate your future. As long as you're breathing, it's never too late, man. It, that's that's really the deal, you know. Right. Sobriety has given me everything that drugs and alcohol promised me. Right. I promise you that. I I, I read something that you never um, you never lost anything. You gave it oh, away. I gave it all away. I, right. I could take you to the street corners in Baltimore City where the new owner resides with it. You know what I mean? Right. I, I hear people say they lost things, they lost things. No, man. Just like I hear people freshly sober, they say, yeah, life showed up. Life had been showing up for me. I just chose to wake back up and show up to it. Right. You know, like I didn't, it's, it's about me being accountable for my actions. I hear you. And that's such a great message for all the listeners. I'm, I'm super happy that you showed up and I'm super happy you shared your story. We're going to continue, you know, um, giving you more information on Novak's uh, program and, and the books that he's coming out with. Um, man, thank you for showing up, man. Oh, thank you for inviting me and being part of the solution, man. It yeah. takes a village to raise a child, man. I can't do this thing alone, but we together can. You got any yeah. last words, Angie, you want to say? I just want to say thank you because you do have an authentic and real story. And I think your message is needed because there's so many people out there 
who are dealing with this darkness, right? But you yeah. found the light. Yeah. And I think it's now you have the light that you can, you know, show yeah. others who are probably in the same situation that you were. Absolutely. So thank you because the disease of addiction does not discriminate from Yale or Jail, no, outhouse to the White exactly. House. The results are all the same. And it's one everywhere. out of seven people will be affected. My mother's a nuclear physicist on the board of Mercy Hospital. My brother's an attorney in the White House. My father dies as a direct result of the disease of addiction. I came from better. I knew better. I just, yes. I, I just didn't know. Uh, Junior, you want to you say something? Yeah, actually. Okay. Let me know if I'm close. I'm actually super excited that I got a chance to be here and meet you today because I grew up skateboarding. Okay. Um, and to be honest with you, I grew up kind of uh, watching your story, you know what I mean, since you were in CKY, CKY2K, and all that fun stuff. And I can honestly say that I related a lot when I used to see you back in the days because I was always kind of like the clown of the group, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, also. So I was always like kind of doing the stupidest things, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just to kind of get acceptance or just because I really had nothing. Go I'm not going to lie. I didn't have much going for myself. I was, I'm was i seven years sober now. I, wow. I Congratulations, I overdosed on drugs and alcohol on in 2011. That's when I overdosed. And I realized, wow, I have not accomplished anything. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when I saw that you were sober, that totally – it actually, it made me super stoked that I, because I'm not going to lie, I saw kind of like what you were going through, you know what I mean? I always saw you on the shows, Viva La Bam and everything. Yeah. And I always saw you were kind of on a good one, you know Yeah, what I mean? oh, absolutely. So I was like, damn, like, he was able, and, he, and I'm not going to lie, you were on some pretty more hardcore stuff than I ever, you know, sure. messed with. So I was thinking, damn, if he can do it, I can seriously still stay sober and I can do something positive with that. Absolutely. So that's what I was just telling her before you came in. I was like, I really want to be a motivational speaker and I want to help people inspire. I want to inspire our youth yeah. that feel nowadays like money and women and drugs is like the key to happiness. Basically. Yeah. And so isn't. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you even listen to hip hop music, but I do. Yeah. 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 Like a lot of like little pump six, nine, they all are drinking the lean yeah. and they all are popping Zanny bars. And it's just like, the music nowadays, I, you know, nobody's filtering out what these kids say. And it seems like they're putting those things on the forefront of their videos. And, you know, they're sipping on lean with the purple cup. And it's just like, I don't know if that, you know, my, my, uh, I have a four year old mm -hmm. and he was watching Little Pump the other day and he was sitting there saying, uh, Gucci gang, Gucci gang. But then, you know, he was talking about lean, mm -hmm. my four year old. Uh. You know what I mean? And I didn't really, uh, and shout out to Jace, but I didn't really catch on until like he started saying the lyrics and i go wait wait a minute like kids nowadays have i mean that's part of their entertainment they they go on youtube they see the videos mm -hmm. and they they're learn, almost conditioned yeah they're conditioned and uh yep. they learn the words and i don't even you know they don't know what they're saying it's it reminds me of that catch me outside girl you know what i mean yeah and it, i saw that and i'm like are you kidding me like this is the kind of stuff it really like is inspiring these kids to want to do this kind of, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah, I want to be rude to my parents and make them a bunch of money. You know what I mean? It's but no like, one tells them the end results of those actions. Yeah. You know what I mean, same with me. I went to the first high school party and I wanted to impress this girl. So I got the red cup and I was drinking out of the cake. Didn't really want to, but I didn't want to be like ostracized as the weird kid. Yeah. Then some lines of cocaine came around and got, she did one. So I can't not do one because I want right. her to like me. But no one told me with that first line, that first red cup that like at the end, uh, I'll be selling my body for forty dollars to anybody that will buy. At the end, my mother will buy me a plot. At yeah. the end, she'll pray for my death. You know, no one told me that. Maybe we should come out with a book that shows that. Yeah, straight I'm, up. I'm serious, man. I mean, I'm like that. Dead serious too. Like that. That is something that you know might be might open up an, an eyeball, spark a light bulb. You know. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe tough love is what kids need. Maybe they need to see that. Yeah. And, um, you know what, for me, what it was, was, was I, I did the worst thing that I could have ever done for my drinking and drugging career. I went and I sat through a meeting and that killed me because, you know, ignorance is bliss, yeah. right. but when you know you're to be held accountable and that sucks. And I sat through a meeting and I remember what they told me. And then I remember hearing someone say, it's really hard to drink a glass of wine when it's cut with N.A. Or AA. Yeah. It's really hard to shoot a bag of heroin when it's cut with N.A. Because it just didn't sit right. Yeah. You know? And, it, yeah. and it, oh, it was the worst. Hey, man. Well, I know you're busy, bro, and you know, uh, I, but I, I just want to thank you, and, and I can't thank you enough for getting this message out. Um, you guys got to look out for his books, look out for his films. Uh, Brandon Novak, man. Yeah, hey, man. One thing I want to tell you, bro, we share the same birthday. I don't know if you knew that. December 10th, 10th. man. Well, wow. Right on, man. Sagittarius. <laughs> Sag, Sag, my birthday. Yeah, my mother's <laughs> the 13th, too. And uh, I want to give a shout out to awesome. 
I want to give a shout out to uh, Joshua. I have a, a foster saying that Joshua is he's fighting cancer, so I want to give a shout. Oh, wow. out. I want to give a shout out to Joshua because he's uh, he's listening right now. And You'll be out. in my prayers, Joshua. Absolutely. All right, man. Brandon Novak. Yeah, shout out to you. Valerie. Shout out to Jace. Shout out to everybody listening. Thank you, guys. Brandon Novak in the building. It's not your local show. 90.3 FM. Yeah. Thank you for everything. If you're looking for help, call me, man. 610-635-9092. You heard it. Peace.